So it's really traditional to start out poetry readings with an invocation to the muse. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to call down the gods of poetry for um, everybody reading here tonight. Um, we have freshmen through seniors uh, from Hellgate sitting right over here. And thanks moms and dads and sisters and cousins and uncles and best friends that came to um, give them support. Over here we have 7th and 8th grade students from Potomac School and they'll also be saying poems from the Poetry Out Loud program, the very same poems that our high school students uh, memorized. I really want to thank the English teachers at Hellgate because in their classrooms, whether the uh, teachers and students decided that they wanted to have someone from the classroom represent them and come here tonight or not, um, they encourage poetry all the time. And to, it, it, to it, encourage people to memorize poems is a really great thing. Um, yeah, that's a cell phone poem. And you guys should turn your cell phones off, please. Um, without the English teachers at Hellgate, then this program wouldn't work because there wouldn't be all these great students over here that have memorized poems uh, tonight. So I want to thank them. I also want to thank our judges. Our principal, Russ Lodge, is here, and he also judged uh, poems in the classroom. So thank you. I haven't forgotten that I'm supposed to do the invocation to the muse, don't worry. Um, another judge here tonight is Kim Anderson. She directs the uh, Festival of the Book program for Humanities Montana at the university. Thanks, Kim. And uh, a community member and a writing coach, you might recognize him in the halls of, of uh, Hellgate, is Jeff Badnock. He's on accuracy. And then we have uh, two teachers, Debbie Hendricks and Jill Mason, that are telling, doing all the math tonight. Um, so that's great. And uh, Lisa Waller is also to be thanked. She's taking photos. Uh, right after the competition, it'd be great to get a group photo of you guys. So if you can hang out, please do for that. And then we need headshots of the top three poets, or. Uh, students reciting uh, so that we can put that in the program for the regionals so please stay and also receive your um, your gifts I found some great books of poems um, for the the folks that come out on top looks like we have all of our lists reconciled here so um, I'm going to read this oh one more thank you to Jean Croxton who lined up the technology is it is it working okay Right. Oh my God. Oh my God. Amber Gray Morning and I went to Washington D.C. two years ago in the spring because Amber won the the uh, Montana State Poetry Out Loud contest. She's a uh, 2008 graduate of Hellgate High School and she's here judging. <laughs> We spent so much time together, I can't believe it. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is a Robert Bly poem, very short. Um, as I said, the, the English teachers here and all the teachers at Hellgate are really, you know, to, to blame for you guys being over there. Uh, this is a Robert Bly poem called Gratitude to Old Teachers. When we stride or stroll across the frozen lake, we place our feet where they have never been. We walk upon the unwalked, but we are uneasy. Who is down there but our old teachers? Water that once could take no human weight, we were students then, holds up our feet and goes on ahead of us for a mile. 
beneath us, the teachers, and around us, the stillness. I want to introduce now, that was to you, Omuz, Muse. I want to introduce now um, your MCs for tonight. It's Reed Roberts and Adrian Kransky. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Our first poetry recitation will be all the original poems written by students here at Hellgate. Our first is Adam Cook reading Voyage of the Rock called Kyle. Let me just sit. And a quick note, please. For all the poets, if you need help with the microphone stand, just wave us one of us down and we can get it for you, or I'll get it one for you. And um, please turn off all electronics and keep your feet off the seats. Thank you. I'm uh, Adam Cook, and uh, I will be reading the quasi-epic poem based on the short story by Adam Cook, The Voyage of the Rock Called Kyle. Kyle was a rock, uh, uh, great and awesome in his flatness and brownness, and so informed by Reverend Forrest Denizen's great and small, whilst atop lofty forested ridge he sat, he found contentment but euphoria distanced and elusive. Kyle cursed and considered his position and predicament as a rock, a being notoriously unable to reach that which is distanced and thusly made elusive. Until a great tree before him was felled by wind and rain revealing the desirable terrain below said Kyle, how I so wished to be there, and so was his wish granted. As said Tempest felled the tree, so was Kyle felled. Slipping over saturated ground, he rolled two tons unrestrained. On edge now, he was a wheel tearing across the open slope, avoiding by narrow fortune the arboreal buttresses of cedar, subalpin fir, and Engelman spruce, they who would shatter him and remain unscathed. But on he rolled and cursed Mo for his scale of hardness, on which Kyle was three and no more. <laughs> Shrubs in his path made desperately to pick up their offspring and flee, but forgot that they, as shrubs, could not pick up their offspring, much less flee. <laughs> Kyle now was rolling into that land which he had seen from above, the great flat saddle with its dry, soft soil. But his matchless speed granted not his wish to stop, and so careened he to the south from soaring precipice previously unseen. Said Kyle in the stoic resignation of his plunge, why have I cursed Mo? For he has not made me soft, rather he has informed me of my lack thereof, and so educated me. And so ended Kyle's flight, as he was obliterated by quartzite boulder which bore the blessing of Mo. Said Kyle, I am many. <laughs> It was wonderful. Next we have Sarah Miller, entitled I Remember You. Yes. <laughs> I did an original poem called I Remember You. I remember the sound, <sighs> sorry. I remember when we would talk. We would talk about everything. I remember how we would have deep conversations that no one else would have with you. You knew everything about what was going on. You, you, you never, you knew, you would feel my pain as I did yours, though you never, be you knew, you, you felt my pain as I did yours, you never, you never backed away from what you felt, you never forgot, you never left, until she came around, and things did change, I don't know if it was for the best or for the worst. I hated not talking to you. I hated how I never had you there when I needed you. I 
I sometimes wonder if you're, if you're still there, I sometimes wonder if you care. I remember the sound of the keyboard typing away as I was writing to you, but you never did respond. Till that day you did. I, I, I was scared of what might have happened between the two of you, but never once questioned it. I wanted to hold you close and tell you everything is all right, but never gotten the chance to. If only there was a way to get you out of this hell that we are both in, I wonder if you'd ever come back to me. But, but if only, but it's as if you're too far away to even care if I was there to help you through all the things you're going through. But, it, but I can't seem to let you go. I want to, but there's nothing I can do to keep you as my own. You never thought twice of what you've done to me. I waited for you, but you never came back. You never thought, you knew. I sit and cry and weep for you, but though you never thought once about what you've done to me, done to my soul, done to my heart. I loved you, yes, but it says it, but I think it is now time for me to, to say goodbye. To, to never, to, to never, to never calling you my own, to finally saying goodbye till we meet again. Never hearing your voice, never wanting to let go, but have to. Goodbye, my love. Goodbye to what we had. To never seeing that sweet smile. Goodbye. Thank you, Sarah. Next up, we have Bridger Franson with a self-titled poem, Lost in Your Eyes. Bridger? No, okay. Um, then next up is Kelsey Barber, Immortal. I'm Kelsey Barber and I'm performing Immortal. The clouds surrounding my body as I walk through heaven. My dreams don't end. Each footprint disappears, for I'm not walking in this lifetime. Here, I float. My immortal corpse floats. No gravitational pull, no strings attached. Air, wind, sun, rain. Never knew the world could, could come together like this. Two peas in a pot. My heart would be racing. My mind confused. My soul happy. However, the godforsaken universe that surrounds me now will not allow these, these feelings, for I am immortal now. I have no heart, no mind, no soul. Thank you, Kelsey. Next, we will have Leela Bayless reading her original poem, Laughter. Gathered in convivial colloquies, an agglomeration of youthful grins boil, word bubbles bounding absurdly, anxious atoms amplify expressions, cacophonous cadre, contrary speech, twisting turmoil, a helix mayhem, polyphonic sentences out of reach, perplexing digressed larynx born bedlam. Only bits of the compartment register, absent mind intermixing cognitions. Evervest thought woven by cluttered ear, knitting gnarled knots of opposed divisions. Adjacent to its adjunct acquaintance, an antithetical silence glimmers. The pixelated troop softly simmers. Twinkling exhale turns mirth avalanche. Harmony shines, interlaced by delight. Many bubble-building bodies unite. Only pure passion can parent concords, so once wrapped rabble returns discord.
Thanks, Lula. Next up, we have Timothy McMaster. This poem is a work in progress. <laughs> This uh, poem is actually titled, uh, Eulogy of an Assassin. <clears throat> Here's a time had finally come. He'd been the best and destroyed all the rest to obstacles he did not succumb. And when I say the best, I do not lie. He slayed an admiral with the strength of his thigh. Others he destroyed with his solid might. They could not beat him, but they put up a fight. He'd look him in the eye and they'd start to shake. He'd say goodbye and them forsake. Under the dirt from the earth. He was the fastest kid in the West. But some for him were just no contest. He could move in the blink of an eye. Put him down without having a try. Now although old Seabiscuit is now dead, that horse will forever be remembered in my head. His legend will live on long after he is gone. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have a last minute insertion, Annika Preston reading her original poem with no title. Hello, I'm Anika Preston, and I'm reciting a poem that is partially mine, put together by many versions of a very famous poem. Ladies and gentlemen, hobos and tramps, cross-eyed mosquitoes and bow-legged ants, I stand before you to sit behind you and tell you something I know nothing about. Admission is free, you must pay at the door. So pull up a chair and sit on the floor. <laughs> the show is over, but before you go, let me tell you a story I don't really know. One bright day in the middle of the night, two dead boys got up to fight. Back to back, they faced one another, drew their for swords and shot each other. A deaf, <laughs> a deaf policeman heard the noise. He came and shot those two dead boys. If you don't believe this lie is true, just ask the blind man, he saw it too. Thank you. And now we will have a short intermission into the regular Poetry Out Loud contestants, and we will be entertained by the original works of Zach Maurer.
All right, now we'll be proceeding to the competition. Um, I would like to take a moment and once again thank the judges. Um, Kim Anderson, Russ Lodge, our principal, Greg Pape, Amber Gray Morning, Lynn Car Carlisle. <laughs> Carlisle, and... Bandenoch? <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce your last name. Is it Jeff? Oh, Jeff Badnock. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was fishing for that. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, um, first we'll be hearing Aidan Shackleton, and his poem will be Eagle P Plain by Robert Francis. really bright. As mentioned, I'm Aidan Shackleton. I'm reading Eagle Plain by Robert Francis. Or not reading, speaking. The American Eagle is not aware he is the American Eagle. He is never tempted to look modest. When orators advertise the American Eagle's virtues, the American Eagle is not listening. This is his virtue. He is somewhere else. He is mountains away. But even if he were near, he would never make an audience. The American Eagle never says he will serve if drafted, will dutifully serve, etc. He is not at our service. If we have honored him, we have honored one who unequivocally honors himself by overlooking us. He does not know the meaning of magnificent. Perhaps we do not altogether either who cannot touch him. Thank you, Aiden. And judges, if you ever need more time judging, simply motion, nod, and we'll wait. <laughs> okay. While the judges are still preparing, I will introduce our next poet. It is Ariel Robert reading Solitude by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. So I'm Ariel Robert, and tonight I'm performing Solitude by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. <sighs> Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Sing, and the hills will answer. Sigh, it is lost on the air. The echoes bound to a joyful sound, but shrink from voicing care. Rejoice, and men will seek you. Grieve, and they turn and go. They want full measure of all your pleasure, but they do not need your woe. Be glad, and your friends are many. Be sad, and you lose them all. There are none to decline life's nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gall. Feast, and your halls are crowded. Fast, and the world goes by. There is room in the halls of pleasure. Um, sorry. Feast, and your halls are crowded. Fast, and the world goes by. Oh, succeed and give, it will help you live, but no man can help you die. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train, but one by one we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. Thank you, Ariel. 
Next, we'll have Ashley Gostell reading The Mother by Gwendolyn Brooks. I'm Ashley Gosnell, and I'll be reading The Mother by Gwendolyn Brooks. Abortions will not let you forget. You remember the children you got that you did not get. The damp small pulps with a little or with no hair. The singers and workers that never handled the air. You will never neglect or beat them, or silence or buy with a sweet. You will never wind up that sucking thumb or scuttle off ghosts that come. You will never leave them, controlling your luscious sigh. Return for a snack of them with gobbling mother eye. I have heard in the voices of the wind, the voices of my dim killed children. I have contracted, I have eased, my dears at the breast they can never suck. I have said sweets if I sinned, if I seized your luck. And your lives from your unfinished reach. If I stole your births and your names, your straight baby tears and your games, your stilted or lovely loves, your tumults, your marriages, your aches, and your deaths, if I poison the beginnings of your breaths. Believe that even in my deliberateness, I was not deliberate. Though why should I whine, whine that the crime was other than mine, since anyhow you were dead, or rather, or instead, you were never made, but that too, I am afraid, is faulty. Oh, what shall I say? How is the truth to be said? You were born, you had body, you cried. It's just that you never giggled or planned or cri cried. Believe me, I loved you all. Believe me, I knew you, though faintly. And I loved, I loved you all. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Carolyn Rechtenwald reading Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, hi, I'm Carolyn Rechtenwald, and I'll be reciting Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea, but we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabelle Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee, so that her high-born kingsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. For the angels, not half so happy in heaven, when envying her and me. Yes, this was the reason, as all men knew, in this kingdom by the sea, that a wind came out of a cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide, I lay down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride in her, sepul in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. Okay. Before we proceed with the Poetry Out Loud competition, we would like to thank um, the eighth grade, um, the middle school, um, kids from Potomac because they have a few poems to read and they'll be reading theirs in between and throughout the Poetry Out Loud competition. First, we will be um, hearing A Red, Red Rose by Robert Burns recited by Brianna Johnson.
Hello, my name is Brianna Johnson. Yeah. And oh. Hi, my name is Brianna Johnson, and I will be reciting A Red, Red Rose by Robert Burns. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like a melody that's sweetly played in tune. So fair art thou, my bony lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas go dry. Till all the seas go dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun, and I will love thee still, my dear, till the sands of life shall run. So fair thee will, my only love, and fair thee will a while, and I will come again, my love, as though it were 10,000 miles. Thank you, Brianna. Next, in the Poetry Out Loud competition, we will have Kobe Jordan reading O oh, Captain, My Captain by Walt Whitman. I'm Kobe Jordan, uh, I'm reciting my cap O oh, Captain, My Captain by Walt Whitman. O oh, Captain, my captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack, the prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting. While follow eyes a steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. Uh. But O oh, heart, 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 oh the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. O oh, captain, my captain, Rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung. For you the bugle thrills. For you the bouquets and ribboned wreaths. For you they call, the swaying masses, their eager faces turning. It is some dream that on the deck you have fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound. The voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. So exalt those shores and ring o' bells. But I, with mournful tread, walk the deck my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. Okay, next we have Corrine Wenborg reading for love by Robert Creeley. I'm Corinne Wenborg, and I'm doing For Love by Robert Creeley. Yesterday, I wanted to speak of it, that sense above others to me, important because all that I know derives from what it teaches me. Today, what is it that is finally so helpless, different, despairs of its own statement, wants to turn away, endlessly to turn away? If the moon did not, no, if you did not, I wouldn't either. But what would I not do? What prevention? What things so quickly stopped? That is love yesterday or tomorrow, not now. Now love also becomes a reward. So remote from me, I've only made it with my mind. Here is tedium, despair, a painful sense of isolation, and whimsical of pompous self-regard. But that image is only the mind's vague structure, vague to me because it is my own. Love, what do I think to say? I cannot say it. What have you become to ask? What have I made you into? Companion, good company, cross legs with skirt or soft body under the bones of the bed? Nothing says anything, but that which it wishes would come true. Fears what else might happen in some other place, some other time, not this one. A voice in my place, an echo of that only in yours. Let me stumble into not the confession, but the obsession I begin with now. For you also, also some time beyond place, or place beyond time. No mind left to say anything at all, that face gone now, and to the company of love, it all returns.
Thank you, Corrine. Next, we have Ian Thomas reading Echo by Daryl Hine. Hello, I'm Ian Thomas, and I'll be re reciting Echo. Echo that loved, hid within a wood, would to herself rehearse her weary woe. Oh, she cried, and all the rest unsaid. Identical came back in sorry echo. Echo for the fix that she was in, invisible, distraught by mocking passion, passionate, ignored, as good as dumb, employed the O unchanged with repetition. Shun love if you suspect that he shuns you. Use with him no reproaches whatsoever. Ever you knew, supposing him to know, no melody from which you might recover. Cover your ears, dear Echo, do not hear. Here is no supplication but your own. Only your sighs return upon the air, ere the music from the mouth be gone. Thank you. All right, next we have Emily Juarez reciting And Soul by Evan Boland. I'm Emily Juarez, and I'm going to recite And Soul by Yvonne Boland. My mother died one summer, the wettest in the records of the state. Crops rotted in the west, checked tablecloths dissolved in back gardens, empty deck chairs collected rain. As I took my way to her through traffic, through lilacs dripping blackly behind houses and on curbsides to pay her the last tribute of a daughter. I thought of something I remembered. I heard once that the body is, or is said to be, almost all water, and turning southward, that ours is a city of it, one in which every day the elements begin a journey toward each other that will never, given our weather, fail. The ocean, visible by the edges cut by it, cloud color reaching into the air, the liffy storing one and summoning another, salt greeting the lack of it at the north wall. And as if that wasn't enough, all of it almost every evening ending up inside our speech. Coast, canal, ocean, river, stream. And now, mother. And I drove on. And although the mind is unreliable in grief, at the next cloudburst, it almost seemed like they could be shades of each other, the way the body is of all of them. And now they were on the move again. Fog into mist, mist into sea spray, and both into the oily glaze on the railings of the house she was dying in as I went inside. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Our next one will be another Potomac kid. <laughs> uh, Brittany Kleeman will be reading the poem Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. Hi, my name is Brittany Kleeman, and I'm reciting Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. It was a many, many a year ago in the kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived to me may know by the name Annabelle. 
This made him should live with no other thought than to be loved and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea, but we lived with a love that was more than a love. I and my Anna Bully, with a love that the winged surfs of heaven covered her and me. And this was the reason long ago in the kingdom by the sea that a maiden that lived to me may know by the name Anna Bully. This made him should live with no other thought than to be loved and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea, but we loved with the love that was more than a love. I am my Anna Bully. With the love that the winged surfs of heaven covered her and me, so that her high-born kinsman came to bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulchre in the kingdom by the sea. The angels not half so happy in heaven when admitting her and me. Yes, that were, yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in the kingdom by the sea, that the wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle. Our love was stronger by far the love of those who are older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels above nor the demons down under the sea can never dissever my soul from the soul of my beautiful Annabelle. And the moon never beams without giving me dreams of my beautiful Annabelle, or the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of my beautiful Annabelle. And so the night tide lit up on my side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. Back to the competition. Next up, we'll have Isabel Huff reading Hysteria by D Dionisio D. Martinez. Nice. <laughs> My name is uh, My name is Isabel Huff and I'll be reciting Hysteria by Dionisio D Martinez. It only takes one night with the wind on its knees to imagine Carl Sandburg unfolding a map of Chicago puzzled then walking the wrong way. The lines on his face are hard to read. I alternate between the TV, where a plastic surgeon is claiming that every facial expression causes wrinkles, and the newspaper. I picture the surgeon reading the lines on Sandberg's face, lines that would have made more sense if the poet had been, say, a tree growing in a wind orchard. Maybe he simply smiled too much. I'm reading about the All-Star game, thinking that maybe Sandberg saw the White Sox of 1919. I love American newspapers, the way each section is folded independently and believes it owns the world. There's this brief item in the international pages. The Chinese government has posted signs in Tiananmen Square forbidding laughter. I'm sure the plastic surgeon would approve. He'd say, the Chinese will look young much longer, their faces unnaturally smooth. But what I see, although no photograph accompanies the story, is laughter bursting inside them. I go back to the sports section and a close-up of Rookie in mid-swing, his face keeping all the wrong emotions in check. When I read, I bite my lower lip, a habit the plastic surgeon would probably call cosmetic heresy because it accelerates the aging process. I think of Carl Sandburg and the White Sox. I think of wind in Tiananmen Square, how a country deprived of laughter ages invisibly. I think of the great walls of North America, each a grip on some outfield, like a rookie's hands around a bat when the wind is against him. I bite my lower lip again. I want to learn to think in American, to believe that a headline is a fact and all stories are suspect. Thank you, Isabel. Next, we have Jasmine McKenzie reading Phenomenal Woman by Maya Angelou. Oh man, it is bright. Hi, I'm Jasmine McKenzie and I'll be reading Phenomenal Woman by Maya Angelou. Pretty women wonder, where my secret lies? I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model's size? But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say it's the reach of my arm, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman? 
that's me. I walk into the room just as cool as you please, and to a man the fellows stand or fall down on their knees. And then they swarm around me, a hive of honeybees. I say, it's the fire in my eyes, the flash of my teeth, The swing of my waist, the joy in my feet. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's the arch of my back, the sun in my smile, the ride of my breasts, the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. So now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say it's the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care. Because I am a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. All right, thank you. Um, next, we'll have Jensen Ro Roseboom, and he will be reading A True Blue American by Delmore Schwartz. Hello, I'm Jensen Roseboom, and I will be reciting A True Blue American by Delmore Swartz. Jeremiah Dixon was a true blue American, for he felt... One more time. Okay, Jeremiah Dixon was a true blue American, for he was a little boy who understood America, for he felt he must think about everything, because that's all there is to think about. Knowing immediately the intimacy of truth and comedy, knowing intuitively how a sense of humor was a necessity for one and for all who live in America. Thus, natively and naturally, when on an April Sunday in an ice cream parlor, Jeremiah was requested to choose between a chocolate sundae and a banana split, he answered, unhesitantly, having no need to think of it, being a true blue American determined to continue as he began, rejecting the either or of Kierkegaard and many another European refusing to accept alternatives, refusing to believe the choice of between, rejecting selection, denying dilemma, electing absolute affirmation, knowing in his breast the infinite and the gold of the endless frontier, the deathless west. Both. I will have them both, declared this true blue American in Cambridge, Massachusetts on an April Sunday, instructed by the great department store, by the five and ten, Taught by Christmas, by the circus, by the vulgarity and grandeur of Niagara Falls and the Grand Canyons, in tutored by grandeur, vulgarity, and the infinite appetite gratified, and shining in the darkness of the light on Saturday at the double bills of the moon pictures, the consummation of the advertisement of the imagination of the light, which is, as it was, the infinite belief in infinite hope of Columbus, Barnum, Edison and Jeremiah Dixon. Thank you, Jensen. And thank you, Zach, for having genius on cue. It was wonderful. <laughs> Next reader, we will have Joel Kramer reciting Invictus by William Ernest Henley. My name is Joel Kramer, and I'm inciting Invictus by uh, William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. In this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, 
I am the ma cap I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Thank you. <clears throat> Alrighty. Next we have another Potomac student reading their poem. And the, the poem they're reading is actually a favorite of mine. It's the same poem I read for Poetry Out Loud and didn't make it in. <laughs> <laughs> it's Emily Grills reciting Zoom by Simon Armitag. Hi, I'm Emily Grills and I'm reciting Zoom by Simon Armitage. It begins as a house, an end terrace in this case, but it will not stop there. Soon it is an avenue which cambers arrogantly past the Mechanics Institute, turns left at the main road without even looking, and quickly it is a town with all four major clearing banks, a football team, I oh know, a daily paper and a football team pushing for a promotion. On it goes, oblivi oblivious of the planning acts, the green belts, and before we know it, it is out of our hands, city, nation, hemisphere, universe, hammering out in all directions until suddenly, mercifully, it is drawn aside through the eye of a black hole, emerging smaller and smoother than a billiard ball, but weighing more than Saturn. People stop me in the street and badger me in the checkout queue and ask, what is this, this that is so small and so very smooth, but whose mass is greater than the ring planet? It's just words, I assure them, but they will not have it. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Next, we will go back to the Poetry Out Loud competition with Juliana Payne reading We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Hello, my name is Juliana Payne and I'm performing We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? <sighs> Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Next, we have Catherine Vincent reading a history lesson by Natasha Trethaway. Oh right. That'll have to do. My name is Catherine Vincent, and I am performing history lesson by Miss Natasha Trethaway. I'm full in this photograph, standing on a wide strip of Mississippi beach. My hands on the flowered hips of a bright bikini. My toes dig in, curl around the wet sand. The sun cuts the rippling gulf and flashes with each tidal rush. Minnows die at my feet, glinting like switchblades. I am alone, except for my grandmother, other side of the camera, telling me how to pose. It's 1970, two years after they opened the rest of this beach to us. 40, since the photograph of her standing on a narrow plot of sand marked colored, smiling, her hands on the flowered hips 
of a Cotton Meals actress. All right, thanks. Uh, next we have Kayla Rolick playing, <laughs> reciting, playing dead by Andrew Hudgens. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kayla Rolick and I'm going to be reciting playing dead by Andrew Hudgens. My father liked to play a game. He played that he was dead. He took his thick black glasses off and stretched out on the bed. He wouldn't twitch and didn't snore or move in any way. He didn't even seem to breathe. We asked, are you okay? We tickled finger, fingers up and down his huge pink stinky feet. He didn't move. He lay as still as last year's parakeet. We pushed our fingers up his nose and wiggled them inside. Next, we peeled his eyelids back. Are you okay? We cried. I really thought he might be dead and not just playing possum because his eyeballs didn't twitch when I slid my tongue across him. He's dead, we sobbed, but to be sure, I jabbed him in the jewels. He rose like Jesus from the dead, though I don't think Jesus drools. His right hand lashed both right and left, his left hand clutched his scrotum, and the words he yelled, I know damn well I'm way too young to quote him. <laughs> Thank you, Kayla. <laughs> Next, we have Lily Ellison reading Shall Earth No More Inspire Thee by Emily Bront. My name is Lily Ellison, and I will be reciting Shall Earth No More Inspire Thee by Emily Bronte. Shall earth no more inspire thee, though lonely dreamer now? Since passion may not fire thee, shall nature cease to bow? Thy mind is ever moving in regions dark to thee. Recall this useless roving. Come back and dwell with me. Thy mind is ever moving in regions dark to thee. Recall this useless roving. <sighs> when day with evening blending sinks from the summer sky, I've seen thy spirit bending in fond idolatry. I've watched thee every hour. I know my mighty sway. I know my magic power to drive thy griefs away. Few hearts to mortals given on earth so wildly pine, yet none would ask a heaven more like this earth than thine. Let my winds caress thee, like comrade, let me be, since naught beside can bless thee. Return and dwell with me. Thank you, Lily. That was really lovely. Next, next, <laughs> next we have another Potomac student, Mercedes Chief. Mercedes Chef. Hmm. Reading Hope is the Thing with Feathers by Emily Dickinson. Hi, my name is Mercedes Chef, and I will be reciting Hope is a Thing with Feathers by Emily Dickinson. Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings a tune without the words that never stops at all. And sweet as sand the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I have heard it in the chillest lands and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crime of me. Thank you. Next we have Liza Crockett. Mm -hmm. Is it drowning? Reciting Drowning in Wheat by John Kinsella.
like they said, I'm Liza Crockett, and I'll be doing Drowning in Wheat by John Kinsella. They'd been warned on every farm that playing in the silos would lead to death. You sink in wheat, slowly, and the more you struggle, the worse it gets. You'll see a rat sail past your face, nimble on its turf, and then you'll disappear. In there, hard work has no reward. So it became a kind of test to see how far they could sink without needing a rope to help them out. But in the midst of play, rituals miss a beat, like both leaping in to resolve an argument as to who'd go first and forgetting to attach the rope. Up to the waist and afraid to move, that even a call for help would see the wheat trickle down. The painful consolidation of time and that acrid chemical smell of treated wheat coaxing them into a near dead sleep. Thank you, Liza. Next, we have Lucy Laritz reading Icebound by Walter Bargan. Hello, um, I'm Lucy Laritz, and I'll be reciting Icebound by Walter Bergen. Sky's gray sheet spreads icy rain. Through the night, we heard the branches cracking. Now, they bend with a bowed ache of apostrophes. Backs to the window, sitting on the couch, we listen as the radio announces a list of schools closed. An hour earlier, I inched my way along the road, tires spinning towards the ditch. And now, now I read aloud to a teenage daughter who tolerates my foolishness, my claim that Lao Tzu traversed a more slippery world. With two books open on my lap, one in my hand and two on the floor, I am surrounded by imperfect translations. A gathering chaos, something mysteriously formed, without beginning and without end. Formless and perfect. She responds, sure, I knew that. So what? I persist that existed before the heavens and the earth, before the universe was born. She's ready to go upstairs and listen to the radio. I ask, what was her face before her parents were born? Nothing, she answers. I ask again. She says it again. Where are the angels? the knights on humble knees, the psalms of faith, the saints of daylight. She walks out of the room. I'm surrounded by thin books. How pointless it is to go anywhere on this day, or maybe any other, but then, but then the time comes and there's no other way but to stand firm on ice. Thank you, Lucy. Next up is the one, the only, Marcus Schluter, <laughs> reciting Stopping by the Woods on a Snow Evening by Robert Frost. Ladies. I'm Marcus Schluter, and I'm going to be reciting. Oh, hold on a second. Robert Frost's Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Sometimes written the woods on a snowy evening. <clears throat> Whose woods these are, I think I know. 
His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. <laughs> um, next we have Rachel Sheff reading In Praise of Pain by Heather McHugh. Okay, as noted before, I'm Rachel Sheff, and I'll be reciting the poem In Praise of Pain by, he by Heather McHugh. A brilliance takes up residence in flaws. A brilliance, all the unchipped faces of design, refuse. The wine collects its starlets at a lips fault. Sunlight with a nicked glass angles and affection, where the eye is least correctable, where arrows of unquivered light are lodged, where someone else's eyes have come to be concerned. For beauty's sake, assault and drive and burn the devil from the simply perfect sun. Demand a birthmark on the skin of love, a tremble in the touch. In come a cry, and let the silverware of nights be flecked the moon pocked to distribute, more or less, indwelling alloys of its dim and shine, by nip and tuck, by chance's dance of laws. The brightness, drawn and quartered on a sheet, the moment, cracked upon a bed, will last as if you soldered them with moon and flux, and break the bottle of the eye to see what lights are spun of accident and glass. Fabulous. Next, we'll have another Potomac reader. Um, this is Kayla Olson reading I Heard a Fly Buzz When It Died by Emily Dickinson. <laughs> Okay, she's, she's not here. Hi. Instead, Eric Kapaka reading <laughs> Annabelle Re Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. Hello, my name is Eric Kapelka, and I will be reading the poem Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And that maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than just love. I am my Annabelle Lee. A love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this is the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee so that her highborn kinsmen may come and bore her away from me to lock her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. But the angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. And this is the reason, as all may know, in the kingdom by the sea, the wind blew out of the cloud, chilling and ki killing my beautiful Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was far stronger than that of those far older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demon down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. 
And so, by all the night tide, I allowed I am by side, my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. Thank you. Next, we have Raina Walther reading A Song in the Front Yard by Gwendolyn Brooks. Hi, I am Raina Walther, and I'll be reciting A Song in the Front Yard by Gwendolyn Brooks. I've stayed in the front yard my whole life. I want a peek at the back. Where it's rough and untended and hungry weed grows, a girl gets sick of a rose. I want to go in the backyard now, and maybe down the alley, to where the charity children play. I want a good time today. They do some wonderful things. They have some wonderful fun. My mother sneers, but I say it's fine how they don't have to go in at quarter to nine. My mother, she tells me that Johnny May will grow up to be a bad woman, that George will be taken to jail sooner or late on account of last winter he sold our back gate. But I say it's fine. Honest, I do, and I like to be a bad woman too and wear the brave stockings of night black lace and strut down the streets with paint on my face. Spectacular. Next we have Raven Dryden reading A Psalm of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. My name is Raven Dryden, and I will be reading A Psalm of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. What the heart of the young man said to the psalmist. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us farther than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums are beating, funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God overhead. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing, shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. That was lovely, Raven. Next, we have Robert Stoltz reading Channel Firing by Thomas Hardy. I'm Robert Stoltz, and I will be reading Channel Firing by Thomas Hardy. As soon as they're finished. <laughs> That night, your great guns, unawares, shook all our coffins as we lay, and broke the chancel window squares. We thought it was the judgment day, and sat upright while drearysome, arose the howl of wakened hounds. The mouse let fall the altar crumb, the worms drew back into the mounds. The glebe cow drooled till God called no, its gunnery practice out at sea. Just as before you went below, 
the world is as it used to be. All nations striving strong to make red war yet redder. Mad as hatters, they do no more for Christ's sake than you who are helpless in such matters. That this is not the judgment hour, for some of them's a blessed thing. For if it were, they'd have to scour hell's floor for so much threatening. Ha ha, it will be warmer when I blow the trumpet, if indeed I ever do. For you are men, and rest eternal sorely need. So down we lay again. I wonder, will the world ever saner be, said one, than when he sent us under in our indifferent century? Many a skeleton shook his head. My neighbor Parson thirdly said, Ah, whoops. So many a skeleton shook his head. Instead of preaching forty year, my neighbor Parson thirdly said, I wish I'd stuck to pipes and beer. Again the guns disturbed the hour, roaring their readiness to avenge, as far inland as Storton Tower and Camelot and Starlit Stonehenge. Thank you, Robert. Time for our last Potomac reader. Taylor Fister will be reading Let It Be Forgotten by Sarah Teasdale. Hi, my name is Taylor Fister, and I will be reciting Let It Be Forgotten by Sarah Teasdale. Let it be forgotten, as a flower is forgotten, forgotten as a fire that once was singing gold. Let it be forgotten forever and ever. Time is a kind friend. He will make us old. If someone asks, say it was forgotten, long and long ago, as a flower, as a fire, as a hush footfall in a long forgotten snow. Joyous. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Next, we have Silly, Sylvie, <laughs> Sylvie Tang Po reading Full Moon by Eleanor Wiley. Hello, um, my name is Sylvie Tang Po, and I'll be reciting Full Moon by Eleanor Wiley. My bands of silk and miniver momently grew heavier. The black gauze was vaguely thin, the ermine muffled, mouth and chin. I could not suck the moonlight in. Holoquid and lozenges, a love and hate. I walk in these, stripped and ragged rigmaroles. Along the pavement, my foot soles trod warily on living coals. Shouldering the thought I loathe, in their corrupt disguises clothed. Morality I could not tear from my ribs to leave them bare, ivory and so rare. There I walked, and there I raged, the spiritual savage cage. Within my skeleton raged afresh to feel behind a carnal mesh, clean bones crying in the flesh. All right, next up, Tycho Thorpe, reading Larkinesky by Michael Rain. Ryan. Michael Ryan, all right. Hello, my name is Tycho Thorpe, and I will be reciting Larkinesque by Michael Ryan. Reading in the paper a summary of a five-year psychological study that shows those perceived as most beautiful are tre yeah, treated differently I think they could have just asked me, remembering a kind of pudgy kid in late puberty, the bloody noses and wisecracks because I wore glasses. Though we all know by now how awful it is for the busty starlet whom no one takes seriously, the loveliest woman I've lunched with, lamenting in the opacity of the body, they can never trust a man's interest, 
even when he seems not just out for sex. And who would want to live like this? And what does great beauty do to a man? Don Juan, Casanova, Lord Byron. Those fiery eyes and steel jarlins confront a furnace of self-loathing. All those breathless women rushing to him, while hubby is at the officer ball game, primed to be consumed by his beauty, while he stands next to it, watching. So maybe the looks were dealt our best. It's only common sense that happiness depends on some bearable deprivation or defect. And who knows what great conflicts beauty could have caused. What cruelties one might have suffered from those now friends. What unimaginable possibilities smiling at every small turn. So, if I get up to draw a tumbler of ordinary tap water and think, what if this were nectar dripping from delicious burning fingers, will all I've missed knock me senseless? No, of course not. It won't. Thank you. Next, we have another one by Annika Preston, and she will be reading Phenomenal Woman by Maya Angelou. Okay, once again, I'm Anika Preston, and I'm reciting Phenomenal Woman by Maya Angelou. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please, and to a man the fellows stand or fall down to their knees, and then they swarm around me, a hive of honey bees. I say, it's the fire in my eyes, the flash in my teeth, the stride of my step, the joy in my feet. I'm a woman phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves will wonder what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. But when I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's in the click of my heels. The arch of my back. Wait, what? Okay, it's in the arch of my back. The sun of my smile. The ride of my breast. The grace of my style. I'm a woman phenomenally. Phenomenal woman. That's me. Now you understand just why my head's not bad. I don't shout or jump about or huff to talk real loud. When, I, when you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. It's the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care. I'm a woman phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Okay, I must apologize, I lied earlier. We have one more Potomac reader. Keeson Thomas will read Ode to Solitude by Alexander Pope. Hi, I'm Keeson Thomas and I'm reciting Ode on Solitude by Alexander Pope. Happy the man whose wish and care, few paternal acres pound, content to breathe his native air in his own ground whose herds whose herds whose herds of milk whose fields of bread whose flocks supply him with attire 
whose trees in summer yield them shade in winter fire. Blessed who can unconcernedly find hours, days, and years slide soft away in health of body, peace of mind. Quiet by day, sound sleep by night, study and ease. Together mixed sweet recreation and innocence which most does please with meditation. Um. All right, that's all for the poetry. Um, real quick, I'd like to thank Ashley for playing the piano for the opening, but I'd also like to thank Zach Maurer for playing the piano in between. Uh, take it away, Zach. Oh, and real quick, we're just waiting for the judges to tally up the scores, so sit tight.
Cusack. The results are in. But first I would like to thank a few people. First I'd like to thank Bolton Rothwell, who is the master of this theater. <laughs> What's his name? Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> and then I would like to thank Ron Shaw, who is, Shaw, <laughs> who is uh, filming this event. Thank you. And lastly, a big thanks to Miss Gant, Sean Gant. We love her for putting this together and generally brightening everyone's day. Take it away, Miss Gant. I really was impressed by everyone that we cited. I know that takes a lot of work, and we really, really felt those poems. And I was touched, and I think everybody here was. So good job, you guys. And now you're all really have won this poem that you have by heart the rest of your life, which is the best thing. Um, so we did this judging part, too. And um, I want to talk about the original um, Quotes first. Um, we we decided to have you know I guess it's it's just so weird in a way to judge all this stuff. But okay, I'm over that. Um, <laughs> uh, the top three are um, Adam Cook for Voyage of the Rock Column Kyle.
Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, these are two Montana poets. One is Mark Gibbons, and uh, the other is Lakeisha John. Despite all the technical difficulties, <laughs> Jeff Bannon, thanks a lot for doing that. <laughs> well, I said it would end at 8, and it's 5 to 8, so good job, everybody, for keeping us on time. Please congratulations.